Hello, my name is Jorge Valdivia, and I am the Performing Arts Consultant for the National Museum of Mexican Art. On behalf of the museum, I want to give a big, warm welcome to our beloved friend, Sandra Cisneros. Sandra, thank you so much for joining us. Thank so much you. For I think the last time we saw each other was uh, in Mexico City, no? Yes, it was. It was yeah, great. We had that. It was so cool to have a little yes. bit of Chicago there in the Who would have thought it was a small, intimate reading with like less than 60 people? Mm -hmm. And you were there. Yes, I was there. It was all a coincidence. And actually, that's part of the interview. We're going to be talking about that later because that was actually your very first time presenting in Mexico ever. And you did it. No, not the first time presenting. The first time presenting that book because yeah, I presented yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And you did it with the help of your friend, Astrid Haddad. So we'll, we'll be talking about that because that was a very powerful evening, which we'll talk about later because there was someone else in the audience, front row and center, uh, Elena Poniatowska, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So uh, I want to start off. Uh, Quality audience. Yes. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, if you, if you wouldn't mind uh, telling us about um, and I just, just for everyone who's watching again, this interview is based on the conversations that I've had with Sandra uh, throughout the years as she's visited the National Museum of Chicago. Um, we've had some wonderful platicas and um, even with Esther Hernandez. And, and so it's, we're going to focus on getting to know Sandra as a person. Um, so I know for those of you watching, book. What's that? My life's an open book. And, and you know what, I, I, I'm, I am so grateful for that. And I think that, that uh, a lot of people that are, watched, that are gonna be watching this will be grateful for that as well. So I wanna start off with talking about Chicago. Um, you know, I know that, uh, and we'll get to this later, but you had at some point this sort of love-hate relationship with Chicago that you've been very transparent and open about sometimes. Um, and I, but I wanna focus on some of the fonder memories that you have of Chicago. What are they? And because I listen to you talk and I, you know, and I know that you've talked about how sometimes an artist has to leave home to be appreciated. But when I hear you talk about your upbringing, there are some beautiful memories that you share when you visit. And if you wouldn't mind sharing some of the fondest memories that you have of the city, Okay. That's what well, you were born when in. you say love, hate, I have to think, what do I love? Because <laughs> the hate, of course, you know, is the things I hate about Chicago are still happening now. That's mm -hmm. why it's very heartbreaking for me to come back. I was just on a show with the uh, Omis of Literature. I don't know, two Chicago Omis, uh, Randy and Nelson Santiago, do this wonderful podcast. And they were saying how relevant how Samunga Street was now, and that it was so sad that it was so relevant because things haven't changed in Chicago or in other big cities, which is why we seen the big explosion of Black Lives Matters, because things are still like they were when I was a kid. Yeah. It's very heartbreaking for me. So it's, it's sad for me to come back. It's, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to write my, my book and be a writer if I'd stayed in Chicago, to tell you the truth. But I also had to run away from my, my home for personal reasons too, you know, uh, not just Chicago. It's like everything, um, you know, like I had to run, I tell people that I left when I was 28 because I had to run away from home from my family, not because my family was so terrible. I mean, they're part of the reason why I enjoy going back, yeah. but because I had to reinvent myself and I, I couldn't do it in the way my father wanted me to be a good daughter. His definition of what a good daughter was and my definition of a good daughter were totally opposed Mm -hmm. And, you know, even uh, my brothers didn't kind of get it. I mean, they do now, but at that time. And so I really had to go away. I just felt like um, if I stay here, uh, it's very likely I'll fall in love. And the way I fall in love, it's like, you know, mm, you know I didn't want to fall in love and give myself away completely. I know how I am. Yeah. And I didn't want to have children. After I, after I was the nanny to my niece, I realized how much work it was. And yeah. so I made a choice and said, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do it. I can't invent myself here. There isn't room for me to invent myself. And my dream wasn't to go to Texas. That was the last 
thing on my mind. I didn't even know what Texas was. My dream was to eventually move to San Francisco and be around the Latino community of writers. That really was my wow. intention. I thought that, you know, uh, Texas was just going to be a stepping stone, but it was, uh, it was, but it was a stepping stone to Mexico. And mm -hmm. what I intended to be a year turned out to be 20 something years. And yeah. uh, I was always looking for like, I was always looking for a um, place that I felt I belonged, which is a definition of home, you know? Right. I didn't feel I belonged in my personal house because, you know, here's my house. It's really quiet. And the only thing you hear is the water running in the background. I don't know if you're hearing that, but we've had a lot of, this is time of rain. It rains every afternoon in Mexico. And so we have a tinaco. Now, who has a tinaco in Chicago? I don't know. You don't have a tinaco. I have a tinaco, which is like a water tank. And it's right now, because of all the rain, you know, it's uh, pumping water in the background. So you might hear that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was always looking for a place I belonged. And um, my brothers didn't have that hypersensitivity. They don't have it that I have where everything, you know, noise, I'm very sensitive to noise going on. I don't have music. I have to have it quiet all the time, you know, unless I purposely sit down to listen to something someone sent me and I just listen. I can't, you know, do multitask with lots of uh, stimulus because why? I found out I'm hypersensitive and hypersensitive people um, can't handle all the stimulus. It's almost like I didn't realize that I was parallel to what, what artistic, autistic, not artistic children have, where the yeah. stimulus is too much. There are people, children, who don't have a name for it, and it's called hypersensitivity, hypersensitive mm -hmm. individuals. And uh, I, it's very good for me because I can um, perceive um, energy. You know, I can just perceive if someone's how someone's feeling. Yeah. I can see plants and animals and, you know, the energia, the vibes. And that's really good for a writer or curandera or, you know, shamana. Yeah. So all of that's good for a writer. But it's not so good if you were the daughter of Alfredo and Elvira Cisneros because there was so much noise in my house. And my mother, the first thing she would do is jump up and put on the radio. My brothers would put on cartoons. And it was just, ah, my father put on his television. And you know how it is in Chicago. We're all living on Montonados. We don't have our own room. Yeah. We're lucky. You know, we have our own couch, a couch of our own. You know, so it was like mucho, mucho. It was too much. And, yeah. and my mother didn't get me. She would always just think I was the enchiquiada, you know. Ay. You know? But my father was also hypersensitive, except that he was gone. And I feel like he was the only one that got me. And my brothers would just make fun of me and make me cry. And, you know, I couldn't understand the, the, this condition that I had and that other people have it. And that later on, when I grew up to be an adult, it would be a gift and be part of my profession. I'm just very lucky that I, I found that my profession and that uh, I have writing to keep me balanced because mm -hmm. writing to me is like my medication. Some people have to take medication to keep from having seizures. Yeah. Like in Chicago, uh, I, I, had, I cried every month. I thought that was normal. I cried every month. A dance crying, Jack, every month. And I thought that was normal. <laughs> I thought that was normal. And, and now I realize, oh, my God, you need a therapy. But uh, you know, nobody tells you that when you're coming from the radio that you need therapy. They might, you know, maybe if you're lucky, get the lady next door to rub an egg over your face and that's it, yeah. you know, or maybe if you're real Catholic, go talk to the priest. That's it. Right. If you're lucky. Right. But there's that sense of nurturing our, um, our heart and of taking care of when we're heart sick. Mm -hmm. Isn't that recognition when you're working class? You know, that's for gente, you know, con dinero. Gente chiflada, you know, that think they, you know, they think they got problems. Yeah. But, you know, there wasn't that reality that maybe one child in my family is an artist and that child has as special needs as if someone was uh, having an a epileptic attack. Right. I, was, I was getting those kind of attacks of like all the noise in my house. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned to, um, you know, when you don't have a room of your own, you find a time of your own. So I wound up staying up really late. And my father would say, como una vampira, you know, late at night. 
when I could have privacy to you know, not do anything special, not do anything naughty, not do anything devious. I was just thinking. You know, and that's why the library was so special because mm-hmm. you cannot make any noise. Those librarians would be after your yeah. butt. I love the librarians because they knew we needed a quiet place to think. Yeah. And how can you imagine your life if there's no quiet place for you to create it in your mind? I always tell little children, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was in sixth grade. And I make everybody put their finger on their third eye. And I say, I want you to see that. And imagine it, because that's how everything begins with a seed of a thought. But how could we do that in the house where, like, you know, my father's it's watching amazing. football, my brothers are watching uh, their, their um, Mr. Ed, my mother's got her stubs circle on in the kitchen. You know, it's just too much. It's too much. Now, Sandra, you mentioned your parents, and, and you, want, you touch on something that I also wanted to talk about, because um, when we talked about doing this interview, we, we talked a little bit about your parents and how they influenced you. They both influenced you so importantly and yet so differently, right? Your father and your mother each brought something very important to your, into your life. Can you talk about that? And, you know, and later in the interview, I want to talk, talk about your mom. But for now, let's talk about what they brought into your life because... Well, first, uh, I want to say they were the most ill-suited pair I've ever met. You would think, like, what are these two people doing together? But I think my father and my mother met each other when they were each expecting something different from one another. You know, I think mm-hmm. my father expected, like, a typical Mexican wife. My mother's Mexican-American. And uh, my mother was expecting, you know, a life different from what the men in, in the Pilsen neighborhood could give her. You know, my father had a nice suit with a little crisp handkerchief when she met him. He was bragging about his car, my car, my house, you know, all of that. So I think she thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get out of sleeping with all my sisters and get out of a house with a door with peeling paint and yeah. mice and bed bugs. I'm out of here. You know, she wanted a different kind of life. She was, she was from very poor family came from migrant who migrated so from first generation and my mom spoke this really tough kind of street english like give me that tread you know like real chicago hardcore yeah. no th's just t's and mm-hmm. you know she was like that and uh, but i think they each saw that the other was very handsome very beautiful and they fell in love with what they imagined that person would be because I have evidence that they were in love with each other one time, but it it was this kind of maybe passion that didn't last so long. And my mother soon got very frustrated that, uh, you know, her partner didn't have the kind of um, appreciation for the arts that she did. Mm -hmm. And my father, you know, he just, he was tired. He worked hard. He, He wound up having to work. Uh, manually as an upholster he just wanted to lie down and watch Sabido Gigante is that asking yeah. so much you know just leave him alone he wanted to watch boxing and the silly Mexican TV shows telenovelas he wanted to cry you know he just wanted to be uh, uh, in rest when he got home but yeah. my mother was like no vamanos, vamos al museo. you know let's go do this I want to go to the concert I'm getting out of here I'm going nuts you know so she's mm-hmm. the top so we had these two people that you know, were the most ill-suited for each other, but they were a good team raising children. Yeah. They were so different from other parents in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Like my mom, you know, she never taught me to cook or change diapers. And my little girlfriends were all like making the tortillas and changing the baby's diapers. No, my mother saw me with a book, finished reading the book. And I would feel guilty because it was a novel, but yeah. she would let me. And my father was the one that was like, you got to go to school. Look what happened to me. I didn't finish school. I had an opportunity. I ran away from home. So like it was these two people that knew, man, we made some bad choices, but our kids are going to do better than us. So that's, I benefited from. And I benefited that we weren't being raised in Laredo or Amarillo or some other Bakersfield that we were in Chicago that had that world-class art, world-class museums, museums, and the library made the biggest difference. Plus, my father was first generation, so no one could tell us that Mexican was a bad word. We've been to Mexico. We felt prouder than our neighbors. So, you know, that's important because, like, you know, I went to San Antonio. Some people have never been further south than, than, can you imagine 
that your idea of Mexico is Nuevo Laredo? What? You know, that's all they know. So they're embarrassed. They don't know. They feel bad. That's partially the Mexican fault, too, because they don't, they speak, they speak a, a, a frontera Spanish. And, you know, the Mexicans are, if you know, huh? No sabe hablar. You know, they make you feel bad. And yeah. so they're welcoming you and, and nurturing you so that you can improve your Spanish. So I was very shocked when I moved to Texas that people lived a couple of hours in the border, had never been further south than right. and didn't know their history. They're muy colonizado, super colonized. Yeah. You know, I want to I wanna commend you for talking about the relationship. You're, you're, you're so honest about the relationship that your parents had. And, and I'm, I bring this up because we don't talk about that in our community oftentimes. And it's almost like we hold on to this narrative of a romanticized relationship that our parents had. That's and you, why I'm not married, Jorge. That's why I'm not married. Yeah. Seriously. But, I looked but, at my mother and I said, yeah. nope, not for me. And, and, and you know, I remember you talking on one of your visits to Chicago, you talked about it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this because I need to say thank you. And, and this is why, Sandra, um, I remember you talking about your mother with me and Esther Hernandez, and you said something at the time that I had a hard time wrapping my head around because I, but now I fully understand. You know, you talked about your, your mother as someone who loved the arts, was an avid reader, and someone who loved to just learn and grow. And it was, it's almost as if though um, she was a woman who, because of family obligations, had so many unfulfilled dreams, right? And at the time, I couldn't wrap my head around that. But then I looked at my mom and I said, my mom is exactly what Sandra Cisneros was talking about when she talked about her mom. And yet it's almost like we have a hard time talking about that. The mujeres who live with so many unfulfilled dreams because of family obligations. So I want to say thank you for uh, talking about that because those are conversations that we're not having in our community. Well, you know, thank you for mentioning that because I was the only daughter and my mother, um, maybe I looked at my mother in a way that my brothers didn't or I listened mm -hmm. to her more. Uh, you know, it's not that uh, my mother and I had a perfect relationship. I think she was in some way, she saw me as a rival. So we had a difficult time, but I, I learned to forgive her. And I made her life difficult and she learned to forgive me. So it wasn't perfect. You know how daughters and mothers, you know how that goes. But uh, I think the thing about my mother that I always have a lot of gratitude is that uh, she had a, a, a hunger for life. And she kept reading till the very end. I inherited her bedside books and put them in the altar that I created for the National Museum of Mexican Art. Those are really the books she had on her bedside. So my mom, you know, was a model for me. She couldn't live the life she wanted to be, to be an artist. But she opened the camino for me and my brothers to live the art, in my case, or appreciate the arts. You know, I can't tell you how many of my brothers play an instrument and or draw Mm -hmm. and or uh, collect art, and or, you know, love museums. That's my mom. She planted that seed in us. And, yeah. you know, ever since she lived, she used to live over there by St. Francis Church on Roosevelt there in uh, yeah. Peoria. And uh, she used to walk to the museums to save money with her friend and maybe skip school and go spend the day in the museums. That sounds like wonderful education. When you think about people who have spent their time in the museums, like Basquiat, the painter Basquiat, he would skip school and go to the museums too. That made a whole difference, that education he got in New York museums. My mom, you know, her uh, hunger and time that she spent in the Chicago museums made a woman who was autodidacta, self-educated self-made maybe she couldn't spell but she knew all kinds of words and and writers and she read our textbooks are made for a very different kind of mom you know and i have to appreciate quizás no pudo lograr sus sueños maybe she couldn't reach her own dreams but uh it took like one generation of women perhaps or maybe several maybe i'm lying and just looking at that one i don't know my grandmother's life and yeah. all the ones since the conquest so that arrived at a time when i could be educated because i was just saying to elena poniatowska because i just interviewed her on valentine's day if i had if my grandparents had stayed in the little rancheria 
here in Guanajuato that they emigrated from during the Mexican Civil War, what would my life have been like if I'd been born from different mm -hmm. And I think my, when I look around me here in Guanajuato, what is the library of the women? Their library are those servilletas you use to wrap the tortillas, you know, the little cloths, that yeah. all embroidered with little words. It is mi amor. Sí. Vive conmigo, you know. It is yeah. mi niño. Now that would be my library. So yeah. the, it's phenomenal to yeah. think about the trajectory and, and perhaps it goes beyond the conquest, you know, all these women who maybe all they did was spend their lives, you know, working very uh, uh, difficult lives to feed their family so that I could arrive at a point where, what? I don't know how to make tortillas, but I can make stories and I'm allowed the luxury to be an artist because it really, you know, I, I can't tell you how, every day I'm astonished that I, mm -hmm a writer and I feel so lucky that, you know, I have a house and I have an assistant, I have my little dogs that I get up and, you know, I could go straight to work. I don't have to make the bed if I don't want to, I, right. you know, it's just like, you know, it's like, what? I don't have to do all of that that my mother had to do and feed people and satisfy your husband and satisfy the children. I can't tell you, um, me siento muy bendecida. But I know that I'm standing like on my mother's esfuerzos, yeah. my father's and their mothers and fathers and all yeah. of the literary uh, maestros, espiritual, sea que de mi sangre o no, my, my spiritual family has brought me to this incredible, I didn't even dream this life. I couldn't, it's beyond my imagination. Tuve mucha suerte, no sé cómo. I think I must have had a really hard life with like 12 kids in another life because how did I buck out on this one? No sé. But you look, at, but look at you now. I mean, you sort of, you know, you looked at your mom, you saw her perhaps differently than your brothers did. And it speaks volumes to how that influenced your decisions about your life moving forward. I would ask my mom, like every time I, you know, we had a little private moment, I'd say, Mom, why didn't you, when you were in the hospital, all those times giving birth, mm -hmm. why didn't you ask to get your tubes tied? And I was like, they didn't think about that. They had no control over their fertility. And I always tell young people, one of the three things I tell them, one, earn your own money, my mother taught me, two, control your fertility, which my mother taught me, and no. Three, you know, solitude is sacred. That's our time to create and to nurture ourselves. So why didn't they? Because that wasn't part of their um, consciousness. Right. And so to me, it's like key. Women have to control their fertility. We have to control and have the rights over our own bodies. We got to vote so that we have those control. We don't want to go to the handmaid's tale. This is the time crucial. We have to vote and we have to decide and we have to support the organizations that defend a woman's right to control your body. Because if you don't control your body, imagine, Jorge, if you couldn't control your body, if the law said, no, you've got to have children, or no, you can't have children, or whatever. Yeah. No, you may not have an orgasm, or whatever it was. Can you, you imagine? Right. And you know what? Some of the, I, I, that's another thing that I want to commend you about, because, commend you on, because I still remember us talking about, a lot of people may not know this, if, but if they pay attention, one of the things that you have always advocated for was, was, is for women to talk about the very same things that you're talking about now, to be sex positive, to not be ashamed, Latina women, Mexicanas, to not be ashamed about talking about sex, um, to talk yeah. about, you know, um, the women's right to their own bodies. And, and I appreciate that because I think those are the conversations we need to continue having in our community. Well, don't you think it's a crime that we don't talk about it? Aren't we guilty? Because of yeah. the teen pregnancy, because we're all like, oh, get it on, don't talk about that. Wait a second. You know, the good thing is, like, when I come in and talk to young people, most of the time when I speak, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a teacher, so I can say things and not get fired. You know, a lot of the teachers, they're, they, they can't, but uh, I can. So I try because I think it's so important that we talk about there's so many things where tab are taboo mental health and seeking yeah. a therapist. Uh, 
controlling our fertility and getting knowledge mm -hmm. about our body so we don't get pregnant while we're children. You know, in other times, my grandmother, she was like under 15 when she got married or got carried off, because I, I don't know if she got married, but she got carried away, literally, yeah. by my grandfather. And, you know, and uh, yeah, she did get married, because I saw the baptism certificate in marriage. But, uh, you know, it was one of those things que te robaban when you were a young girl. You know, before you were 15, they would steal you. Yeah. And you have to get married. And so, like, we didn't talk about teenage pregnancy then, because you were already married. You know, now we, we want different kinds of lives. We want women to choose whether they want to be in a union, whether they want to have children. We expect women to be educated. And so, you know, what are you supposed to do with your sexuality? You know, you pretend it doesn't exist. You know, the, uh, the uh, desire that we pretend that doesn't exist. And, you know, to me, we shouldn't be made to feel ashamed about it. It's, it's natural and beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's a wonderful thing about growing up. And it's wonderful. Unfortunately for young girls, we think that, you know, falling in love is going to solve all our problems when it's only going to make things worse. And I wish, I try with my stories to teach girls that, you know, the uh, most important thing is to, uh, to learn who you are, you know, because, you know, uh, another person is only going to muddy at your issues. It's not going to make things clearer. And we're yeah. complicit in creating uh, stories, narratives, mm -hmm. in which uh, everything's going to be perfect if you just find the right one. Even the pop songs, you know, I've been looking all over for you, waiting for you, mm -hmm. for the right one. And, you know, oh, no, lots of people are the right ones. And maybe yeah. you yourself are the right one. You right. Know? So there isn't this idea of completeness and wholeness all by yourself. There should be a song about like, oh, I found the one I love. It's me. <laughs> right, right. And, I, and we don't teach people. You, got, you can't be happy with another person if you're not happy by yourself. yourself. Maybe RuPaul says it. You know, if you don't love yourself, how the oh, hell are you going to love somebody else? <laughs> well, it's like the gospel according to RuPaul. You know, right. you have to learn how to love yourself. You have to learn, just like with a person, you have to get to know that person. Guess what? You have to get to know yourself. And you're still becoming from the years, you know, 12 to 30, you're still like in process. That's why it's so dangerous to want to get married during that time because your partner's still becoming too if they're young. Mm -hmm. And those years, you know, in adolescence is everything so dramatic. Yeah. Everything's so intense. Everything's so tragic. Everything's so como telenovela. It's too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I want to talk a, a moment right now, too, also about the altar, the beautiful altar ofrenda that you did um, at here at the National Museum of Mexican Art. Because I would imagine... And I don't want to speak with, for you. I just, I would imagine that it was both a very emotional and beautiful journey to see that come together. Can you just talk a little bit about that process, what, what that experience was like, putting together the ofrenda? Yeah, because it, it was one of the most popular ofrendas that we've had here. But I also, I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the experience of putting that together. Well, first I have to say that it's thanks to your curator that... Your compañero Cesar, no? Cesario, yes. Cesario, uh, who uh, invited me. What's Cesario's last name again? Moreno. Cesario Moreno yes. invited me. So we must give thanks to the inviter to take part. And he invited me right after my mom died, and uh, the mm -hmm. year after my mom died on Day of the Dead, by the way, November 1st. So he had to wait to the following year, and he invited me, and I couldn't. I was too... Um, Emocionada. I was just too much. It was too close. I was an open wound. I was like this, like the corazón sagrado. I was like, oh, yeah. no, yeah, right now. I couldn't even think about it. I was still dealing. And it wasn't until like three years later that I could like even say, okay, and put all the pieces together. So the first one was kind of troche moche. And then it got refined. It went from there to, um, uh, I think, the Hispanic... ¿Cómo se llama el museo en Albuquerque? The, his, his, the Hispanic uh, 
institute or, or center, algo así. Sí, sí que, que Hispanic, algo con Hispanic, porque there's no Mexicans in New Mexico, there's only his, his Hispanic. <laughs> Was Hispanic ahí con los Hispanics. And then uh, I went from there, which I had a wonderful time, thanks to um, Kay, Diana Rebolledo's daughter, Kay Mariana Nan. She was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Another wonderful museum curator. And then it went from there, I think, to... Um, it moved around and hopped. It okay. went to the Smithsonian. ¿Tú crees? Oh, wow. Smithsonian, and you know, my mother would have loved it. Every time it was in a museum, I felt like my heart just bursting with pride because my mom had planted that seed of museums. Yeah. And then it went to Long Beach, and then it came back to the museum. And by then, it was like you know, each time I did it, it got better and better. The first one was very homemade, and yeah. by the end, it was all own production. Yeah. And I needed assistance. And every time I went somewhere, I would get to learn like a museum and, you know, learn about museums and the staff. And in the beginning, you know, I would have just a few days, I would get really like nervous, especially the first one, because everybody's hammering and there's all these other altars all around you. And it's like, I can't work like this. Mm -hmm. I work with no noise. Ah. But then after a while, it's like, buenos dias, buenos dias. You know, all the other people were like, we're all going to make art together. And it was really cool after a while. I really liked that, saludando a todos, you know, Thanks. food and compartir. It was really nice. But I had to get over being like the diva artist artists working alone and in silence and then realizing oh thank god you're not all alone because that's what you always do how nice to be with other people yeah. and then when i went to the smithsonian no but I, I told people I, I told like the administration i need to work i only have a few hours i'm really stressed me and my assistant assistant have to put all this together no but they put up like little um biombo screens not that, 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 that. it was like mr rogers neighborhood hi i do the lights Hi, I work doing the display. After a while, I told my sister, what are we going to do? I finally figured it out. I would say, come in, have a chocolate. I had candy. They would come in. I had like a little pot of tea I wasn't supposed to have. Have a pot of tea. I started inviting people. Would you like to help? Oh, yes, I would love to help. So everybody helped us. The guy who did the lights, you know, they all took ownership mm -hmm. and helped and they helped us do it out de volado. So sometimes you gotta, always you gotta go with the flow. Yeah. And you gotta not resist, you gotta go with the flow and invite those people who are not keen to take part. Cause guess what? They're frustrated artists. Yeah. They wanna make something and you're like making their lives that week. I can't tell you. And, the, and you know what? I have to tell you a secret. Tell me. At the end, you know, we wanted to, uh, clean the area yeah. with coal, but we were not allowed. Right. Because the museum. Right. That's what we did. <laughs> we invited the director to smoke the altar, the director of the museum, the, the Smithsonian, to smoke the altar. And he had a visiting guest from yo no sé qué, de donde, de, de, de una, un país en Euro, Europa, creo. And they both came, they smoked the altar, and thanks to that, that's how we got around not having uh, anything, um, any lit right. object in the museum. ¿Tú crees? Yeah, yeah. That is an amazing story. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm very familiar with those policies. <laughs> yes, but when you ask the director to give you the honor, pues así quedamos, ¿no? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because um, I remember seeing your ofrenda here in Chicago the year that um, Juan Gabriel died. Oh, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah, year was, was that? It was uh, 2016, was it? Oh. I remember 2016, 2015. I remember um, the ofrenda was directly to, it was just off to the side. They were almost, you know, side by side. Yeah. And, it was a very busy area. And so I just remember that particular area, you know, for obvious reasons, was very uh, busy. And it was just a very beautiful ofrenda that I know that you had built together um, for the museum's uh, permanent collection, right? And then I took uh, my mentors, Gwendolyn Brooks, you know, her daughter, Nora yeah. Blakely, 
met me at the corner diner, that little diner on the <laughs> corner. We went and had breakfast. Oh, you know, it had changed from when Weddos owned it before it was, you know, just sandwiches and eggs. Now it was like, smelled like refried beans. It was oil <laughs> over the air. It was like smoke. I got it in here. We got a limpia from aceite, you know, from <laughs> Solo frita. And we all came out smelling like fried tortillas, but we ate a nice breakfast there. And our life is very cool. I said, come on, I want to show you my mom's altar. And we went. And, you know, it was really special because her mom was special to me. And she yeah. had my mom. And I shared the altar. And we just had a wonderful visit. So it was very cool. Thank you for sharing that story because I think a lot of people don't know that story behind the ofrenda. And I wanted to throw, I, I just wanted people to know the story. It's a beautiful well, story. Well, I want you to know that my nieces and nephews, not all of them because I have them done budget, but some of them made it mm -hmm. and they recognized my mother's bedroom, even though it was an invention. Yes. You know, my mother's bedroom wasn't those colors, that magenta, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, that um, uh, eggplant and sempasuchi color wasn't that color, but they got it. You know, they got it. They said, oh, that's Abuela's room. There's a lot of little knickknacks, a lot of the little framed pictures. Even some things weren't identical, but I tried to get parallel. Yes. The whole idea of the busyness mm -hmm. of the room and the sense of like it was her first room of her own for those last yeah. years. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a testimony too to your mother because she, in a way, got to continue doing what she loved doing in life, which was visiting museums. And she traveled even, she made it to the Smithsonian, you know? That's cool, Jorge. They put her in the room with the ruby slippers. Next to the ruby slippers, not in the neck, right next to, but in that room. And yes. that's what was right next to her display. Um, Archie Bunker's living room. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I went in there and I saw the ruby red slippers and Archie yeah. Bunker's living room. I was like, my mom loves this. Oh, and more than anything, they put all these, you know, the, because we had invited the staff to come in and help us, they mm -hmm. put TLC in whatever they did. So the guy mm -hmm. who did the light, you would have thought he worked for Tiffany, the jewelers, the way he had put set the lights up. So everything yeah. was jewel like, I was like, Oh my God. You know, because he said, I'll take care of the lights. Don't worry. Go, go. And he like, were extra love and when it was all like imagine that like my mother's altar was the ruby red slippers with like those those incredible lights that make everything like yeah. oh my god it was incredible i saw people i'm not talking mexicanos we're talking gringuitos mm -hmm. old and young standing there looking for like minutes and minutes and minutes and there was a woman who came up to me and she said oh this is so moving not latina mm -hmm. she said I'm going to do this for my family. And then I hear from somebody else, I, I want to do this. I didn't know you could do this. You know, people just felt a connection to our culture. I'm sure you see that when they come yes. to the day of yes. death. Everybody we all have in common, you know, death, we, that's the one place mm -hmm. that we all go to. And maybe that's why this time in the pandemic is making us live with the corazón abierto, you know, yeah. in that place that artists put themselves, which mm -hmm. is open the, the heart cleft in two. So it was very, um, it was a magical mystery tour. Each place I was treated well, yeah, good or bad, but I won't say who treated me bad. Oh, wow. Private. But the museum treated me very well. The Smithsonian, the Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque with Te Mariana Nan, such a maravilla, esa mujer. You know, I had really good experiences there. That's beautiful. Thank you for talking about that. Um, if you if you'll humor me, I'd like to talk about um, Have You Seen Marie? Because oh, yes. this this particular book um, I want to talk about because the illustrations were done by your amiga Esther Hernandez, yes. and I remember when I spoke um, with. I didn't want to do it. I had to like arrancar. I had to fregar y fregar y fregar. Come on. I said, no, I don't, I don't do that. I had to make her do it. So, you know, and, and what, what I really appreciate about you that you did is when we talked about, I, I, when I spoke to your agent, one of the conditions was, yeah, she'll come to Chicago. And, but she wants Esther to be there too. And, you know, it, it's, it's, 
I think it speaks volumes to Sandra Cisneros always watching out for her fellow artists. You know what? I was always that kid that like no one talked to because I moved everywhere. And I and one of the things I learned from moving so much that people don't see when you're in pain, but I could always see who was in pain and who was left out. Mm-hmm. And I what does it cost them to say hi to me or include me? It doesn't cost them anything. Why don't they do it? So me quedé con esa herida. You know, we're all made up of these wounds that we work towards healing in our life. And so I think right. that's where it came from, from being the new kid and not being included and feeling left out. So I always want to include everyone. That's my um, blessing and curse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> my, my blessing and my fatal flaw. And uh, it's... it's um, it's good and bad. Yeah. Oh, it is. It definitely. But you know, in this in this particular case, you decide to push Esther and be like, "Come on, do it, do it." She was resistant. Talk, but talk a little. Esther had just had just uh, lost her mom. I remember us talking about that in Chicago too. Yeah, and I knew that she could do it because she was still there with the open wound. I knew it would heal her, mm-hmm. and I, I just knew. And plus, I love Esther. She's so funny and fun to be with. And I just knew she, she could do it. Uh, it's just that she was afraid. You know how, like, if you haven't done something like that, te da miedo. Right. But I knew she could do it. And, uh, oh, my, maybe she regretted doing it because it was a lot of lata. I made her wait in the San Antonio River up to her knees with me and my dogs. I made her get in the water. I made her photograph people. I made people pose. I, you know, she took all these photos. <laughs> she came in the San Antonio, Texas summertime heat. It wasn't the springtime, it was the heat. And we were walking around in my neighborhood like documentary film people. Fue muy bonita la experiencia, la verdad. And it, made, it bonded us, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, usually I had just seen her at Chorritos when I go to San Francisco or Chorritos maybe at an ice house in San Antonio. But this was like, you know, she came, she stayed. We, we did the whole neighborhood. We walked all the streets and took pictures and we asked people, hey, will you pose? Can we borrow your kid? We'll be back on Saturday. You know, we had, <laughs> we had, we had to coerce people, even like a little girl who now is a eight, you know, in eighth grade. Uh, yeah. she and her mom, she's the, the little girl, uh, Eleanor and Blanca, the, the, the blonde Blanca who like many mm. Texans has a Mexican in her lineage. You know, she was crying, that little child. She just got out of school. She wanted to eat lunch. She didn't want to be in my photograph. So she's there like, oh. and I just saw her recently, recently. And I said, aren't you glad, Eleanor, that I made you pose for that book? Mm-hmm. Now she's glad. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting story because I wonder if people knew that that was the process that you went through. Like some people, like the real, you know, the thing is, uh, I wove in a lot of real people in my life, Bill and Roger and the lady cross street, Helen and my neighbor, Carolina. I wove in real people that I knew. And, uh, and then I added people that uh, I kind of knew and people that I would see in the neighborhood. So it became really without my, my realizing it at the time. Yeah. Came a love letter to my neighborhood and a goodbye love letter. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that I was going to be leaving. Who, who thinks they're going to be leaving when you put so much money and energy into your house and your garden and you're thinking seven generations? I certainly didn't think I was going to leave my little house in, in San Antonio. It was a real whipped cream pie. You know, so. Yeah. That, you know, that's, that's, it's interesting because at one point in your life, you, you saw it as a temporary home. But if you, now what you're saying is, you, you, you know, there was attachment there. And you, yeah, know, yeah. you, you know, find yourself writing this love letter that becomes a love letter and a farewell letter. Well, you know, I had an intuitive tell me that um, I was going to live in Texas for many years, but I wasn't going to die there. Oh, and, wow. And I kind of like, you know, that was in the back of my brain, but I, you know, I forgot it. And then I, I didn't, I really thought I was going to leave that house feet first, como dicen. And so I was very surprised, and I remember that intuitive telling me that. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to die in Mexico, but I hope so. And, uh, you know, um, I just, I feel like I still have another house in me, Jorge. Is that terrible to say? You know, mm. I, still, I still look at houses and I <laughs> look at houses, and I say, hmm, 
hmm, maybe that'll be my next house, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of energy and years yeah. to make a house. And then once I start... To make a house a home. Yeah. And then once you finish, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe I need another house and I'll sell this one, you know. But I don't know if that's going to happen with the pandemia. He says, I don't have enough room for my art. You know, even though I gave away so much art when I came here, I've acquired new art. I only brought a few things with me. And, you know, it's like, hmm, maybe I'll have another house. But, you know, well, houses are so expensive and moving is so expensive. So yeah. I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to go to Oaxaca, but then they had an earthquake the other day. Yeah. You know, we're from Chicago. We're not used to earthquakes, you know? <laughs> we're not used to earthquakes. What the hell nos asusta on a chase, right? Just that. Ya nombre. You know, so I don't know. I'm going to want to talk about <laughs> Perdón, I'm going to want to talk about the artwork in a little bit. That's towards the end of the interview. But I want to talk, if, if, if we can, just about two things. The first one is I want to talk about, um, I love, absolutely love, you bring out the Mexican in me. Oh, yes. I love it. And I, I just want to talk a little bit about um how you wrote this because I, I tell you the backstory. Can I yeah. tell you? I was walking down the street in uh, Manhattan with my agent because I never could walk down the street. Even now, my idea of safety is being arm in arm with my agent. Like if I'm ever in a moment of fear, I just have to imagine I'm with my agent. She always mm -hmm. makes me feel so safe. And I was walking with her. I like to walk arm, arm in arm with her like a Mexicana. Yes. How the Mexican women walk. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little strange for her, but I like to grab her and hold her by the arm and walk with her. And I was complaining about... Like the madres. Yeah. I was yeah. complaining about one of my uh, eternos. You know how we have uh, pretendientes? Sí. You know, some that come and go, but then we have eternos. Like, you know, they could be in your past 20 years, but you're still thinking about them. Think, oh, why am I thinking about them? Makes you so mad. Well, this man was my eterno, and I was complaining about him. And I was saying, oh, you know, he, he brings out the Mexican in me. Oh, that's a good lie. I should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I did. But I that time, to it. By that time, I was with another man, and many others had come and, and would come. So I put them all in there. But the man I was with at that time thought mm -hmm. the poem was for him. I let him think that, you know? Yeah. Why? We're not going to offend him. No not to offend him. Feed his ego. Let him think about yeah, it. Yeah, let him think. Right? You know, he was not an eterno, but you know, we let him think. So now I'm sure he's saying, that poem's for me. She wrote that poem for me. No es cierto, mentira. <laughs> I went to like uh, this eterno that I had, and then I realized, you know, uh, when I finished it, that. It was Sorry. for many different people. And I read it differently. Once when I broke up with someone, I read it in tears because I didn't read it, you know, uh, I am woman, hear me roar. I read it as a wounded being. And that was yeah. the hardest time to read that Yoranda. You can read it, Yoranda, and it's completely quiet. And it was like another riff. And I, on, on retrospect, I think that was an interesting interpretation. But at the time, it felt like I had peed in, in front of everybody in class when you're a little kid. And you see those kids that pee in class and, oh, my God, you think they're never going to live that down. Well, I felt like that about being on the stage and breaking and losing it and reading the poem, too. Because it's really, ultimately, I think that when I read it, it's, it's really about you as a mujer, yeah. right? Less than about los hombres. Yeah, it, it, it was, but it, it, in the context of if somebody's just dumped you, yes, you it a different way, and it's like, yeah, listen, that bravado, it's quiet. Mm -hmm. You try reading it quiet with crying after someone's broken your heart, and it's a completely different. What I learned was that I used to read that last line uh, with bravado love, you know, the only way I know how. But after that, I learned to read it in a quiet way. Love. The only way I know how. That's different. Yes. 
and it's it made the poem better even though it was an embarrassing situation to cry on the performance for me and i've been close to tears and i do my best reading when i'm on the verge i don't want to cry but i do my best when i'm not trying to cry it's just that the, i relive everything when i perform i don't you know i'm not remembering i'm reliving it so um you know it's like um Every time we perform, it's like we're swallowing swords, or mm -hmm. you know, and everybody's going, "Oh, hi," you know. But I also, I'm like, "Ah," you know. I feel like I'm the sword swallower, and when I perform, it me cuesta, me cuesta. You know, if I was Amy Winehouse, you know, I understand why she would have to get drunk afterwards. Fortunately, I'm not a drinker on drugs, yeah. and you know, I just feel after the performances, you know. I always, when I come to Chicago, I would make your driver stop on Western Avenue and get a couple of hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to say this. Uh, people might not know this, but as a presenter, I can, I can say this because uh, we've presented it here at the museum many times. And one of the things that I have realized about you is um, I see different levels of, of um, esfuerzo that people put authors into reading right but you are the type of person that wants some space right before you go on stage right and it's 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 almost like hay un respeto allí for that moment that you're asking for because when you go on stage Sandra I'm going to tell you you really now you froze a little bit so which reading were you talking about uh, it was, I did hear, I was going to say, I haven't had a chance to hear you read, uh, you bring out the Mexican in me, but that's not true. I did see you read it here at the museum once. Oh, well, you know, uh, once I read at the museum with another Chicana artist whose name will, I will not name. And I had come from, I made the mistake of coming with my family in the car. Yeah. And the only reason they came to hear me was because they wanted to go to um, eat Mexican food on 18th Street afterwards. That's the <laughs> They didn't come to hear me. They wanted Mexican food. My mom was in the car. They were fighting, you know, same as always. My family's like the loud family. They're yelling, they're fighting. There's berrinches, you know, and I need to be quiet. I, I mean, I'm not trying to be a diva, but I need to concentrate so I could do a good job. And they don't understand that. They're all like, hey, I thought, what was I thinking? I should have taken a taxi cab. You know, this was before Uber. And I just like, oh, no. And I got there and my head was just swirling in my family. You know, you know, muy conchudos, they don't realize. And I asked this other artist if I could go second because I was just not going to do a good performance. I needed 15 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, something alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the puso todo chiflada. I remember Carlos will tell you this story. It was like the war because the other artists wanted me to be the, you know, usually the place of honor is the second. Right. Versus like the backup. And uh, she got very angry, but I wasn't trying to make her angry. I wasn't trying to pull rank. I just really was in a place that I was having like a nervous breakdown and I couldn't perform until I had just to calm myself from my family being mm -hmm. in the car. And to make matters worse, afterwards when they were signing, my brother came up to me and said, Mama's mad, she wants you to go faster because all of the signing takes so long. I was oh. saying, take Mama to the restaurant, I'll be there. Oh my God, you know, I signed and signed. I was so tired. Jorge, when I got to the restaurant, well, first I had to walk to the car because I'm not mm -hmm. the superstar with them. I'm just the, the sister, you know, in the cold, to get to the car. Then we had to like park really far away. Then I'm walking in the cold to the restaurant. We get to the restaurant. Everyone has eaten. There's no food. All tables littered <laughs> with like dirty plates. Nobody has ordered any food for me. Nobody treats me like the, like La Escritora. I'm just the sister. I'm just the daughter. I thought, man, this is the last time I come with them when I'm working. They don't mean it, but they don't understand what I do and what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't be the daughter and go to lunch or dinner with them. Uh, and I can't be the author. You know, it just... You can't be both at the same time. You need a no, space. No, no me conocen. And even now, after all these years, no me conocen, you know? Yeah, but I get it because as a presenter, I think you have to get into the zone. And that requires preparation, you know, yeah, and it's for a some performance. People, yes. It's a performance. Yes. So like I always think, like, you know, imagine when you go to see the Olympics and they're gonna be they're going to do their um, routine, those mm -hmm. ice eaters, 
And, uh, you know, they're about to go on. You could see that they're like, you know, about to go on. And then like, in for me, I'm about to go on and I'm like this and people are saying, can you sign my book? And I say, oh, I'm sorry. I can't right now. Could you wait? Till I can't wait. I gotta go. You know, sometimes I just do it real quick, but then they don't realize that they're making me lose my concentration before I do my routine in front of the judges. You know, it's that kind of nervous. I really feel like I've got to, I feel like you're asking me to climb up a telephone pole mm -hmm. and jump and land into this vaso de agua. It's yeah. that scary for me every time, every time. And, you know, I saw Elenita backstage uh, 10 years ago when she read here and she was the same, temblando like a little tree. And I thought, oh my God, she's, and how, how old is she? And, and, and yeah. famous. And am I going to be like that when I'm her age? I think so. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this as a, as a presenter, just for people out there. Always, you know, try to wait until the actual book signing, um, because that's when the artist is in the zone for that. And, um, and then it's hard as... Very, very yeah. gracious. If you can just... Yes. They don't realize, and I know this, mm. that how nerve-wracking it is for me just before. Yes. Yeah. And so I just, you know, we're about to wrap up with the interview. There's only two things that, that I want to get to. One is I want to say thank you for introducing me to Astrid Adad. I had not met her. And I want to give everyone the backstory on this. We presented Astrid Haddad um, last year as part of the Sor Juana Festival. And her event sold out. But people out there may not know this. I went to go, I went, to, I was in Mexico City for other reasons to go look at theater. And a friend of mine from um, Los Angeles, she's like, hey, she, she coincidentally was in Mexico City too. So she tells, she sends me a text message. She's like, hey, I saw that you're in Mexico City. Let's go see Sandra Cisneros perform. She's gonna do a, a reading with Astrid Haddad. And I was like, what? So she sends me the invite. And I, I was, I'm like, absolutely, let's do this. I went to go have dinner. And from there, nos fuimos caminando to the location, which was, by the way, a beautiful location. I forget the name of Caminos. Camino Silvestre. Silvestre. Yeah. And we get there, and we're the first ones there. And so I, um, I, we sat down, and then we waited and waited. We were there like an hour early or so. And then you get there with Astrid, and Elena Poniatowska. It was a beautiful evening. It was just beautiful. And you performed like comadres. That's what it felt like. Like I was watching comadres perform together. And it was just beautiful. Can you talk about that experience, what it was like for you? You know, Astrid was a little bit nervous because she had not rehearsed. We didn't rehearse. Mm -hmm. I just mm. told her, don't worry, just listen to, you know, follow me and you just read the Spanish and you act like you happen, you're hearing it from a gossipy neighbor and I'll do the same. Yes. So we yes. were just kind of ad-libbing and yes. riffing. So she was a little nervous because I think she's used to more um, precision and rehearsal. Yes. And she hadn't done it, but I knew she could do it. Oh, yeah. So we just yeah. had fun. And then and we did it again in its entirety here in San Miguel and we were even better the second time. Yeah. But you know, after a while, I, I, you're right, Astrid, um, she's a perfectionist too, like you, right? And, but the thing is, como que se calmó, and she had fun with it yes. after a while. That's what right? I told you, just have fun. Yes. Be like, you know, it reminds me like when we were kids and we would dress up and do skit shows, we loved doing that, you know, and acting and having little teatros and making yeah. people laugh. It's the same. And what I want to say is, I want, the reason I say thank you is because when, when you got there, uh, you looked at me and you're like, wait, I know you. And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it took you a moment. I'm like, you travel so much. You're not going to remember everyone. See, the but problem I is when I see people out of context of like yes. the environment, yeah. my little Rolodex in my brain, mm -hmm. you know, it's getting overflows. And I think, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. But in that moment, Sandra, you didn't miss a beat because you said, this is Astrid Adad. You should take her to Chicago. That's what you said to me. So that's why, you know, that led to a conversation. I met up with Astrid. So I want to say thank you because it led to Astrid returning to Chicago to a sold out performance. People loved it. They had not seen her in over 20 years. So thank you for that. But you know, I'm a connector. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always been a connector. And my idea of heaven is that all the people I've met throughout my life will all be at the same party. 
you know, and, and meet each other. Just the joy of, of, of you meeting Astrid, it, it, it me da un placer. I can't, I don't know why. I just like connecting people. And when I hear, like, I wanted to mention that Camino Silvestre is struggling right now in San Miguel. All the businesses and artesanos are oh, struggling. Wow. So your little gift shop, I'm going to send you the info of the person to connect with at Camino Silvestre. Because yes. you know, we have to, right now, we, we need to connect in this time. That, Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a difficult time for everyone. And and there's also when we stop recording some other connections I want to make. So oh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, talk about that. Yeah, yeah we'll talk and, about that. Yeah, but absolutely. I, I just feel like you know, we're. It, what does it cost us to connect? Nada, nada. And, and for anyone, that's, that's, for anyone that's watching right now, um, please, if you have a chance, once you go to Mexico City when uh, everything reopens, visit Camino Silvestre. In, in Mexico San City and in San Miguel, but city's negocios right now, I don't know if they're going to make it. That's why I'm buying all my Christmas presents right now. Yeah. From Mina Silvestre. And everybody should be buying their Christmas presents in July from the Sin Sun San store at the National Museum of Mexican Art in July. If we yes. all did that now, we wouldn't have to worry when December comes. Whew, we're done. Yeah. So this exactly. is a good thing to do while we're on lockdown or I call Santuario, buy your Christmas presents. And what I try to do is strategically support a small business that's helping the artesanos. And I do it from here. I also do it in the United States. You know, I'll try to pick somebody yeah. that I think is doing the good work or somebody that's helping to, uh, you know, give a percentage of the sales to help the animals and the people and who are yeah. hurricane victims. I'm always trying to pick because, you know, we all got to buy a lot of presents, so might as well support the uh, institutions we love. Absolutely, thank you for that. And the last question is, give us an update on, um, this is the last, last question, yeah, pero give us an update on, I read that um, House on Mango Street, there's an adaptation that might happen for television? It will happen. It's, it will happen. You know, I had been uh, holding that book very close and not releasing it because people have talked about films, but all of the proposals for films were la verdad una porquería. So mm -hmm. I couldn't let it go. Uh, I, am I going to give something to someone if they don't have the vision to create mm -hmm. it? And then I wanted to do it myself. And, you know, me and, us, me and my friend Loro Desportillo tried, but we could never come to a contract agreement, which is yeah. too bad because we like each other a lot and we're friends. So, you know, we had to dissolve that idea. And, uh, you know, then I said, oh, you know, if, if it, my ego's not involved in film, so it's, it doesn't matter if it happens. It'll happen eventually, and maybe not in my lifetime. I see. That's how I thought. And then um, last year, my agent took me to a meeting with uh, our film agent. And on the way to the meeting at a Gramercy Park restaurant, Moy Fufurufu, I had never been there, like a, you know, Edith Wharton novel. And... Um, I just had this about face. I had this 360 degree. I suddenly remembered that the year before I had been in these double wide trailers interviewing um, migrant workers mm -hmm. in North Carolina. And I thought, oh, remember what those children were watching on television? They, they watched the Disney channel with Latino actors, Mexican American actors uh, performing in white stories and yeah. white houses. And I thought, no. No. And I said, oh, what if we did television? Television has kind of grown up in the last 20 years. You know, when you yeah. think about the wonderful yeah. television and the writing, yeah. I said, you know what? This is how we're going to counter Trump. We're going to come into your living room and tell you stories that are counter to what you think we are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, House on Mungo Street is a neighborhood of black people. There are Tejano migrant children there. There are poor whites. If you don't understand that, then you haven't looked at it carefully, you know. And that community doesn't happen everywhere in the United States. Yes. Uh, so I thought this is a story for everybody who has uh, worried about their next paycheck. And that's a lot of people in the United States. So I said, yes, I'm ready. And we're in that process now with uh, the uh, Gaumont uh, interviewing writers. We're not even in the, you know, we're still in the very early stages. Uh, even with the pandemic going on, I've got some Zoom meetings. That's one project with House. The other project is that me and Derek Vermel are doing um, the opera. 
House of Manga Street. Right. And he's done some of the music and it's so cool. We're like almost done. We're like a draft six. And that is so much fun to be working it wow. with someone else. You know? That's amazing. Yeah. So. That's great. That, I mean, thank you for sharing that. And I, uh, I guess that's, you know, I don't, I know our, t- our time is up. But I, I want to say thank you. Aww, really? Well, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about connections uh, once I stop recording, because yes. I know you want to talk about that. But um, before we end it, I, um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge what's happening right now. We're living in a time where you started off by saying, we started off the interview by, by you touching on what's happening right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but in the middle of this pandemic, we have seen uprising and we have seen the Black community come together to talk about Black Lives Matter. And it's become not just a national, part of the national dialogue that we're having, but it's become really a global movement. And I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about, um, about that because as an artist, I think that I would, you know, I, I would say that it, probably excites you to see that happening right but I yeah, just, I've been I on those marches yeah you know I've been on those marches since way back I, I remember witnessing the marches in Humble Park neighborhood in yeah. 68 riots you know when I wasn't old enough to march or understand what was going on but yeah. uh, I subsequently I've been in the last march I was in was in San Antonio for immigrants rights at the beginning of this uh, century and, uh, you know, so I'm, you know, I was kind of frustrated that it was always the same people that were marching. And now it's like these coalitions. Uh, yeah. I did go to the march in Washington two years ago uh, when people uh, descended on Washington, D.C. to protest children in cages. And mm-hmm. I was at that march um, yes. more as a kind of trying to look for someone to interview because I'm working on a project. But uh, I was so shocked to see all these white people with their little kids there instead of yeah. you know, immigrants. And I thought, wait a second, immigrants can't be here. They'll get arrested, of course. But the fact that people were so moved about the separation of parents and children that even though they weren't brown, they were there. Yeah. They were there. These coalitions shocked me. So I'm sure the same thing's happening now with you're seeing these coalitions. Yeah. And that's exciting. It is. And, it's so exciting to me to see the young people. On the one hand, I love that it's the young people that are organizing, that they're doing this, you know, with the um, social media. But on the other hand, uh, social media also festers uh, a lot of people talking. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Talking from anger and not yeah. not transforming that anger, and I, that's a worry I have. That mm-hmm. you've got to compost your anger to do something positive. What are they doing with their rage? They're doing something positive, like marching. Yeah. That is that I commend. I admire. I wish I could march too. Yeah. And uh, I it makes us so proud because you look and then you see globally. Then you see mm-hmm. that he's, that Hispanics in New Mexico they want to bring down the. The Oñate statues. Yes, bring down those conquistadores. You know, it's yeah. just exciting time because people are identifying with the Black Lives Matter movement. They're saying, hey, that's me too. And right. I'm brown. Or that's me too. And I'm gay. Or that's yeah. me too. You know, and I'm poor. You know, so there's these wonderful coalitions occurring yeah. uh, in, in our lifetime. So, like, we have to remember this is exciting. We're witnessing uh, a revolution and it's beautiful um, uh, I'm it emotional missing it no yeah no absolutely Sandra I you know I'm gonna stop recording in a bit of, I just want to say before I stop recording I want to thank you como una comadre madrina de ello del museo I just mira <laughs> I want to thank you 